Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 383. Today is Sunday the 26th of July, 2020. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. This week's interview is with David Marquet. David's a speaker and author of the best-selling Turn the Ship Around, a true story of turning followers into leaders, as well as the book Leadership is Language. A graduate of the Annapolis Naval Academy, he became a celebrated commander of a nuclear-powered submarine, the USS Santa Fe, for a remarkable turnaround performance. He left the US Navy in 2009 and has developed a system called Intent-Based Leadership, which could be summarized as give control, create leaders. In this conversation with David, we'll hear about how to let go, galvanize your team, deal with conflicts, and develop a practical purpose. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please consider to drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. David Marquet, great to have you on the podcast. You are someone who um, very, very well selling, uh, big selling books. Turn the Ship Around was obviously a huge bestseller. And the book that, of course, grabbed my attention was called Leadership is Language, since I um, spent a bunch of time in leadership and was a linguistic scholar back in my days. So that's how I initially came into you. But then, of course, the fact is that you have lived the language, lived the life of being a leader, and you did it on a nuclear submarine, which brought me into a whole other area of interest because of my, a, my chance to hang out and spend a lot of time at Annapolis and, and talk to people in the Navy. So I'm really honored to have you on the show, David. In your words, how do you describe yourself? Ha. I am a uh, reformed, in quotations, control freak because I always, I always wanted to be in control. I thought that was what you're supposed to take charge, make things happen, tell people what to do, charge forward, drive the team forward. And I was rewarded for that. And then I had this wonderful experience where I realized that was all wrong. And I had to basically rethink everything about it. And uh, so like, like most reformed whatevers, I'm, I'm a little bit overzealous about about giving up control, but it's it's something I practice uh, every day in my personal life, and then with our with our leadership program. It reminds me of of pilots as well. I mean, because pilots tend to have you know very want to be in control of everything, check their instruments, and yeah. it's sort of part of that need when you're faced with machines that are doing the work with you. There's engineering background. And so it's, I can see how why the temptation is to be that way. I'd love for you to describe how you lost control, if you will. And, and I you know, that... yeah. so I, uh, I, 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 I was in the Navy. I was a submarine officer, uh, the U.S. Navy. And I was doing well by telling people what to do. I was the, I was the geek in high school. I was on the math team and the chess club and the computer club. And all. this is way back in the 70s, heaven forbid. And so I fell naturally into the role of I would stand back, I would analyze, I would see the problems, say, okay, here's, here, here's the deal. Stop doing that, do it this way, blah, 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 blah. And things would get slightly better, and then I would leave, and I would go back the way they were, and I would say, look, see, I, it needed me. And the Navy uh, basically agreed with that approach. They kept promoting me, and they said, oh, you're going to be a submarine commander. And I was like, oh, that's great. And... For 12 months, uh, the way it works in the US is uh, for 12 months, you go to school to learn everything about that submarine because you're going to be the one giving all the orders. So you need to know all the answers. And the two weeks to go, I got shifted to a different ship, a different kind of submarine. And I walk on board, and it's sort of this Alice in Wonderland moment where everything looks different. I mean, the I don't want to over dramatize it because the physics were the same, but everything's different. Now I don't know the answers, but I still, and oh, by the way, it was the worst performing ship in the fleet. They had a worse morale and the worst performance. That's why I went there. It was because the captain quit a year early. Right. So they didn't have anyone trained up. So they said, okay, Mark, don't go there. Go to this new ship. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the end of my life because how am I going to, but these old habits die hard. I, I still trying to give orders. I couldn't. 
the officers would the officers would order it anyway, even if it didn't make sense on this kind of submarine. And I saw the power and the ineffectiveness of this structure of people telling people what to do. And it hit me that we we swim in a world where we take for granted that telling other people what to do is the right thing to do as leaders. What, and we have words, leaders, followers, management workers, uh, salary worker, hourly, hourly worker, white collar, blue collar. We don't even question that structure. And I was like, why do we have that structure? We have the same thing. We have white collar, blue collar in the Navy. College educated people tell, not college educated people what to do. Not college educated people. I mean, these are obviously gross generalizations, but. Sure. This is basically the idea. And I, I said, I, so when I gave an order and the officers were trying to do it, even though it doesn't make any sense, and I saw the pernicious power of, of this, do what you're told, it hit me like, we don't need to actually operate this way. And so we just started talking differently. And the idea was rather than me leaning into the team and telling them what to do all the time, I actually leaned back, it was very uncomfortable. And the day would come to me and say, Captain, what should we do here? And I was like, uh, what do you guys think? What, what would you do if I weren't here? And, and at, that moment, at that moment, did they not say to say, well, you're, you're weak? Wait, 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 he's not telling me what to do? No, we, we talked about it. We, we, they may have been thinking that. And I'm, and I'm sure some people were. Because I was not, look, I did not look like the movie caricature of a submarine commander at that moment. Yeah, the, the fist and, pounding, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I so one, two, three, two. Here, the yeah. enemy's here, we're going to do this. And, and, and oh, by the way, I'm always right. Of course. So, yes, sir. So, because so, they, first of all, they knew they were in the worst performing submarine with the worst morale. No one liked it there. They were all focused on a, make sure you don't make any mistakes. It was so, that was really. Cover cool. your ass. And exactly, which biases everyone towards not doing anything. And then, uh, and, and they saw, they were witness to this event where I had said, hey, why don't we, basically it was like, hey, why don't we shift into second gear, but it was only a one gear motor and the <laughs> officer ordered it. I said, so like the, the problem isn't I gave a bad order. The problem is I'm the one giving the orders here. Since I don't have the technical knowledge on the ship, I shouldn't be the one giving the orders. You guys need to tell me what to do. now. Now I reserve veto right, so I can stop you, and I can say explain it. But if you change, so so the 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 thing was, and I never talked about empowerment. I just said, just tell me, say, just tell me what you intend to do. Now through practice, it felt like empowerment. It felt like power, but I I don't like I don't like that word because it's polluted in my mind. And so at that point, you you got them starting to think. And at what point did they start not coming to you with the question? I mean, because I mean, what I used to like to say was, "Don't come to me with a question; come to me with a solution." I mean, which, yeah, well, um, another form almost, of that, maybe. Yeah, almost immediate. I mean, it depends. Some some of the guys almost imme like immediately. The meeting ended, and five minutes later, uh, the engineer comes to say, "Captain, here's my here's the situation. Here's what I intend to do." Great. Here's the situation. Here's what I intend to do, and. In the past, they might say, here's the situation. I would, I request permission to do this. So in a way, it really wasn't huge. They, they were bringing solutions, but they didn't truly own the solution. And in general, I felt like I was providing, I was putting energy into the system. I was exhausted at the end of the day. And I was like, I got to run around, tell everyone what to do. It's all on me. And then I got to check on everybody. And when we finally got this thing going, I felt like I was the receiver of it, like energy came to me. Cause all day long, my team, I was having a hard time keeping up. They'd be like, the engineer would say, hey, this is, then the weapons officer and the operations, and they were, all, they were all coming to me. And I was like, whoa. And it was awesome. Cause there was this, the problem is we poach, we, we say we want ownership. We say we want people to act like entrepreneurs or whatever, entrepreneurs or whatever word we use. We want people to risk it uh embracing in the right way but then we steal that we, we steal we poach the ownership how do we do that when someone when i go down to your desk mentor and i say hey mentor give me an update on project abc guess who owns that project i i just stole your ownership 
when you come to me and say, hey, David, here's what's, here's what's going on with Project ABC. Here's the situation. Here's what we're going to do about it. You own the project. But if I'm always coming down to your desk, you have no opportunity to come on down and tell me. So I got to lean back and wait and cross my arms and say, hmm, even if it pops in my head, what's going on with Project ABC? And during, the right, and, yeah, and during that time, you, you, so now you're leaning back. Yeah. What did that materially mean for you? And did that allow you to do a whole raft of other things that allowed you then to start leveraging up at a different level? Yeah, so it, it, it was weird how it worked and I couldn't have predicted this. So I would lean back. So first of all, it was very difficult because my instinct was every time I leaned, every time my team came to me and said, oh, what should we do? And I didn't tell them what to do. I felt, I felt like I was doing the wrong thing if, uh, because we were, it was, there was like this delay. Because so I would say, well, what do you guys think? And sometimes it wasn't long. I would just say, go sit here for 30 seconds. And then t so we, 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 these were very short period. Now tell me what you would do if I weren't here. That, and that's like all it was. But even that 30 seconds was very difficult. But what happened for me was, uh, so, so one of the things you have to do as a submarine commander and, and a good submarine crew is you're basically doing pattern matching. You have all these patterns. You have the patterns from uh, sonar or the listening. You have patterns from what you're seeing at the periscope. You have power, patterns from the uh, satellite messages that you're receiving, the, the, the intelligence data from what you might think the enemy's doing. And you're trying to sort out what, and they're deliberately trying to fake you out. They deliberately are trying to make you think they're south when they're really north. So you, you're trying to sift through all this. So what happens is I'd be sitting in the control room, I'd be looking over at the sonar and then the th this, and because I wasn't in the weeds trying to tell everyone what to do, it would hit me, hey, you know, I think this and this, that could be the same thing. This thing that we're seeing out there and this thing that we're hearing, maybe that means blah, blah, blah. And I would, I would vocalize that. I, and I wouldn't be sure. So I had to express a vulnerability. i say, you know, guys, I think there's a possibility that we got this wrong. And then they would look at it and they go, oh, my God, Captain, you were genius. How'd you figure that out? Like, I don't know. I don't have anything else to do. <laughs> And, and, and then sometimes they would feel bad, like, well, I didn't see it. It's like, yeah, but that's not your job. Like, you're, you're, you're running the ship, you're running the nuclear reactor, you're in charge of the torpedo room. And so that frees a different level of people, like me and the second in command. Like, we can just sort of, now we can put these patterns together. And it made us much, 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 much better. Because it was a question when we got it wrong, and we would, like, correct. One of the, the areas that I think is always interesting is thinking about how this comes to home to roost, if you will. So you, you've allowed to lean back, your, your, your team at the, in, the, in the submarine are, are able to deal by themselves. You come home and you also need to shift there. How did that go down? And I'm thinking about with kids and this notion, because I know as a father, you know, my temptation is, well, you know, son, you need to do this. And, yeah. Or my wife comes to me with a problem and I want to fix it, but actually she doesn't want to fix it, just want to talk about it, right. that kind of stuff. So how did, how did that go down? Tell me. Uh, how old is your son now? He's 23. Okay. My daughter's 21. So, yeah, so perfect. So, yeah, when you start, when, when your son's two, you have to tell them to some degree what to do. When, they, when they're five and they're riding in the car, you have to tell them put on their seatbelt because they don't know what a car accident is. They don't know how their body can be maimed. So we, start, we started telling people what to do, but by 23, hopefully, they're, they've internalized it and they're telling you what they're planning on doing for the life. And so there's this graduated, so you're backing off gradually. So you back off of the seatbelt and then they put the seatbelt on. And then you back, then it's the next decision kind of, well, how late can I stay out? Where can I go? What kind of friends do I hang out with? What am I, what classes am I going to take? Where am I, uh, that, that kind of thing. And so there's this graduated leaning back. It's not, a, I, I, I picture a light switch which is the wrong metaphor. And I'm a dimmer. <laughs> it's, it's much more like a dimmer. And it's like, I just grab, because if you, it's a light switch, like, no, you decide. 
Like that's too much. Yeah. So you lean back. So let's say your your kid's 15 and they say, well, I want to stay out overnight. And this is a new behavior. And you could say yes, or you could say no. Or what I would recommend is something like, okay, let's try that. Let's do it. Like, so for a month, you can, you can control your own weekends. Uh, I'd like to know what you're doing, but I'm not going to control it. And then at the end of the month, we'll talk about it and we'll see how to work for you, how to work for me, that kind of thing. So you run a short experiment and then you reflect upon it. When you're working at the, uh, doing this work at, this, at the Santa Fe, um, I was wondering how you fed this back to Annapolis or at least to the Navy <laughs> and to what extent they embedded uh, those types of thinking into their instruction and into their philosophy. Because as you know, I know a little bit about Annapolis and I certainly you know, would think that the, there's still a command and control phenomenon in the military in general. Yeah. But how, how did that conversation go? What have you seen in terms of their changes in the, in the past or in the near term? Well, so on the positive side, uh, if you go on any submarine now, you'll hear these words, hey, I, I intend to. The, the, the submarine force basically operates this way now. The idea of intention-based leadership, intention-based activities. Yeah. That's what I intend to do. Stating what you intend to do and making someone stop you as opposed to stating what you'd like permission to do and making someone give you permission. So there's a much more of a bias for, for action and ownership in this environment. And they, they put, turn the ship around on the Navy. Uh, it was on the Navy's reading list for a number nice. of years. Uh, on, the, on the other side, so, so three years later, I left the Santa Fe. We had set records for operating, like the highest score in the history of the Navy for, on inspections for how to operate the submarine. Amazing and, turnaround. And keeping people in the Navy. 0.0 people came to me and said, oh, hey, this interesting. how did you do that? And it bothered me a little bit. No, uh, number one, I wasn't entirely sure I could have explained it at the time because I was so much in it and it felt right. very messy and chaotic. We would just try things. But I, I interviewed a bunch of people, including my boss. Uh, my, and here's what I think happens. There's a, par there's a paradigm that lead good leaders Bad leaders give bad orders and good leaders give good orders. And so when they see the submarine improving, now I'm out at sea, they don't see it. We would invite visitors and we had inspectors and they would sort of see it, but, but they were just, oh, Mark Hayes just out there giving some brilliant orders. He learned the ship and gave, he, now he's, he's, he's giving brilliant orders. Their brain doesn't go to, oh my gosh, the, they figured out how not to give orders and how to have the crew and the officers tell him what to do. Like that's too far. So they're just projecting what they know about leadership and they already know the answer. There's like, why ask? Because they already know the answer. And so I've, that's kind of what I got there. I had this very weird meeting in Annapolis because some, uh, one of the admirals said, hey, 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 you guys at Annapolis, the Naval Academy where we teach young men and women leadership. Cadets. How to be naval officers. And they said, you need to hear about this thing. So I fly there and I'm, I, I, I get invited into his meeting and there are three people with PhDs across the table for me. They're all sitting on that side of the table and I'm sitting on this side of the table and they're all sitting there with their arms folded and they say, well, how can we help you? And like, oh, well, um, I thought I was going to help you. <laughs> But they already knew everything because they had PhDs, so there sure. was really no helping them. Know it alls. In 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 the transfer that you've done, you were now talking in business, and and how how like, give me some ideas as to how that movement of losing or you know stepping leaning back. I mean, because yeah. it's very funny. We we got the whole movement of leaning in um, with um, the Facebook lady. What's her name? Um, but how does that? How does that translate into business? And and tell me maybe what what doesn't work. You know, it's because philosophically, yeah, yeah, I read the book, I get it. Oh yeah, ta da 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 da. How does it not work? And and maybe also give an example of how it does go down in a business environment. Yeah, I'll get let let's talk about how it does work. It, it 
So the operations officer for a franchise of 20 McDonald's is in the old pattern. She goes to visits half the stores every day, sees problems, tells the store manager what to do, goes on to the next store. The next day she has to visit that ha those half the stores to check to see that they're doing it and visit the other half of the stores to tell them what they need to do. And she's stressed, she's overeating, she's pre-diabetic, she's unhealthy. And so it's just craziness. And so we flipped the whole thing. So now she goes to one of the stores, sits down and has a coffee, looks at her phone, she's receiving text messages from all the 20 store managers. Hey, here's how it's going, here's what I'm doing about it. You wanna come by and help us out, great. But if you don't, I, I don't I'm not relying on you. I'm like, I'm. this is what we're gonna do. And uh, then she picks one, she drives there, it's leisurely. It's, oh, hey, come on in, it's friendly. She's viewed as being helpful. She lost 50 pounds. She lost 50 pounds in one year. She's no longer pre-diabetic. She has more energy to spend with her family and that kind of thing. We had a call center at a major bank where they were losing. This is dismal work. These are, these are the people you talk to when you can't when you get your password to work and, you're, and you can't figure out. It's all their fault. Yeah, yeah, what the interest rate is on your loan or whatever. And uh, they're also the lowest people in the high social hierarchy at the bank. I mean, you have the, the financial Pete wizards and the coders and blah, blah, blah. Then you have, anyway, they, they were losing three people a month. They weren't happy. Plus no retention. Yeah. And they had these scripts that they had to follow when you called them. And you sense this when you call someone. And the, the person in charge said, okay, we're going to throw out all these scripts. Don't worry about the time because they had to meet certain production quotas. Say, I don't care how long you spend. I want you to solve the problem. And then, they, and, then, and then they started doing that, which required, it wasn't as easy as just solve the problem and saying the word. They had to actually learn some stuff. They had to learn what tools they had available. But it, it, their turnover went from three to zero. In six months, they lost zero people, which is 18 people who didn't hate their job so much that they said, I have to leave. They saved money, of course, because there weren't people that had to hire and train. The average level of competence in the group went up. And for 10 days in a the row, they only, got a, they only received 10s on their net promoter scores from their customers. And this is a, one of the top US banks. So they're receiving many, many hundreds of phone calls a day. Mm -hmm. And initially, the burden went up because they were spending more time, but because they were actually solving the problem and the problem behind the problem, the total call volume went down. And then the ooh, coders who are like, they're making three or four times as much money as these people said, hey, what's going on over there? Can you guys tell us about our, like what, like what, what do you get called on most and that kind of stuff? So they had the first ever intra department meeting with them and say, and they're like, Hey, I get a lot of people call. They just want to know what the interest rate is on their mortgage. Oh, that's easy. You just click here and you click there and then you go down there and you go and then like, well, can we just like make it a big sign at the top of the page? So they don't have to go click, 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 click. Well, I guess so. <laughs> How much is ego the issue in, in this? Uh, Cause I, when you say coders, I'm going to go bias male. When you say yeah. call centers, I'm going to go bias female. Yeah. And, and hierarchy being that way still, unfortunately. Uh, captains of submarines, I'm sure there are not many women who are captains of nuclear submarines yet. Not uh, yet, yeah. but there are. There, there are. Good. Oh, and, and, and I'm, I, thankfully so. I know that there's a lot of movement on that, but it just, it just makes me think of ego and men in general, the mensch kind of approach and letting go of that. Yeah, I think ego preservation gets in the way. It's not, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as just saying, well, people with big egos can't be good leaders because they're gonna run around and be in charge and tell people what to do. I think there's some natural wiring that makes you wanna feel important and valued in the world. And one of the ways that you think you do that in the short term is by moving the team forward. So, you, so 99, percent of these people are not evil people. Now, I, like, so you take this guy, 
like Winterkorn, who was running Volkswagen, when they had the diesel, is he an evil person? I'm not sure. I'd like to think not. How about the people running Boeing, where they pushed 737 MAX software out that resulted in two airplane crashes and 347 people dying? Probably not evil people, but they were playing a game that where they thought they were doing the right thing. I'm sure they went home and told their spouses they, were, they thought they were doing the right thing. The problem is the tools we have are wrong. So it's not like, like we have a map for London, but we're driving around New York City. So the problem isn't drive better using your map. It's we need different maps. We need a different map for leadership. And like, don't be better at telling people what to do. This is what most leadership programs are. That's why they're dismal. You got to figure so, out how to not tell people what to do. Exactly. As you say in your book subtitle, it's what you don't say sometimes. There's so many questions I have. You have one last one for you, David, and that is uh, around purpose. So yeah. I, I've always thought that purpose is the deepest well of energy. You mentioned before, you've several times this notion of being depleted of energy. And, you know, there's the taxing element of leadership. There's the responsibility can be pressing heavily on your head. And then all of a sudden you mentioned how energy came back to you. Mm. I've always thought that the, the, the area where you can get the, the biggest amount of energy is by feeling a sense of purpose, which at a, a smaller level is being a sense of usefulness, a sense of meaningfulness. But the bigger level is doing something for other people. I was wondering, just if we go back to the Navy a second, to what extent purpose was part of your mojo? And, and is that something that you feel is relevant as well in business? Yeah, I, I'm not sure why, but the picture in my head was we had two, I had two things to deliver. One was combat effectiveness, which was the, our primary product, so to speak. The submarine, when they said, get underway on the 11th of July, we got underway on the 11th of July. We didn't say, oh, we're broke, we can't, whatever. So I had to do that. Number two, though, was delivering back to the Navy effective thinking, more effective thinking officers, which wouldn't have happened if I just told people what to do. But, but then deeper than that, and the reason for that wasn't for the Navy, it was for the people. Because I wanted these people that I was spending, it's a very intimate experience. I mean, you go for six months and you you leave home and you're just in this tube and you're never more than a few feet apart. And you know these people intimately. We eat together, we shower, we bump into each other in the hallway. And, and I wanted them to have better lives and they did. And, we, and, and so the reason I wrote the book is because over the next 10 years, 10 of the officers would send me notes and finally the 10th one said, hey, I'm now a submarine commander. Never thought I would be. Thanks to you, you thought you taught me how to think like a submarine commander, even when I was a junior officer. And it, and and that to me sustains me now. And I think it's an issue of short and long term. Every day, your instincts, our bodies are not wired. Our our brain wiring is 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 biased to like let's survive out running the lion right now i don't need to worry about a retirement plan 50 years in the future like your brain is not wired to do those calculations because we didn't care about you 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 probably weren't going to live that long but for me when i think about like where do i want to be at the end of my life i i do a mental game where i say imagine you got an email from god who said yeah, today's your last day. You had a good run. Like, what would you be thinking about? What, what would you think your contribution was? What would you value? What would you cherish? And what would you think? Oh, God, that was a bullshit waste of time. Why did I do that? And for me, it's, it's the people whose lives are better because somehow you, you were on the planet. And that gives me solace. I Hopefully, if, if I get... Once I, once I get to that point, I'll be able to go peacefully because I'll know 
that some because at the end of the day it's over for you that's it you contributed yeah dostoevsky was given a 24 hour sentence uh before the end of his death and that's one of the reasons why i really appreciated his writing uh which was re reprieved at the last minute but for those who've ever faced that 24 hour moment or at least you know really look death in the eye it does have a way of of putting things into perspective and the other thing I was going to comment on is that oftentimes companies mistakenly, and I have to imagine military also think that the purpose is to defeat the enemy. And, and that, you know, you can rally around people if you have an enemy to kill, whether it's the Cold War, the Russians, or today maybe the Chinese or whomever. And then that's the rallying force and, and you rah, rah, rah behind that. But it, that's the sort of, I feel like that's such a, a much more, a, depletist approach, a negative approach, as opposed to an inspiring contributive approach. And so what I marvel about what you said is that your, your rallying cry was about contributing to these people's lives, because that's not just a new submarine officer, that's a whole family and a, and a whole network of people that can believe that they can do that. Look, you don't want to defeat the enemy. You, you don't want you don't want to go to combat. You don't want to kill people. You don't like that. I never wanted to kill anybody. I hope to hell I never had to kill anybody. But by being ready, by being ready, I we like the theory is if we're ready and the Chinese know if they try to invade Taiwan that the United States Navy will sink all their ships and that it won't work that they won't invade Taiwan and you won't have to. So, I mean, that's the theory. And I believed in that. And, but look, no one wants to, you don't want to, like, no one's, the studies show soldiers are motivated not for God and country, not to defeat the enemy, but to, to take care of the guy in a foxhole. With them. And, and that's, that's kind of the idea. Beautiful. David, I hope um, that people listening have got some inspiration, some ideas that they can bring directly into their lives and make things happen. A uh, pleasure to have you on the show, sir, <laughs> David. Thanks a lot. And uh, look forward to staying in touch and uh, keep reading and keep uh, con writing and contributing to the world. Thanks, Mentor. And, and congratulations on your book about your father in the Annapolis Ring. Really an amazing story. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on MinterDial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why
till the